So hi, um, welcome to the webinar on um, Twitter, the basics of Twitter. I call it hashtags, retweets, and 140 characters, finding meaning in Twitter, because really that's the, the purpose or the content of this um, webinar in a nutshell. Um, this is part one of a four-part webinar series on social media tools. Um, we also had a pre-webinar on Widgeo, and some people are going to be continuing on with Widgeo. Uh, but this is the first one through the um, Digital Learning Day celebration. Uh, and again, this is from the basics. We will be having a Twitter advanced um, webinar coming up on March 6th, which you can register for, uh, as well as a few others. I think the next webinar is QR codes, which is on um, next Thursday, uh, and then we'll have uh, Pinterest after that, and then finish with Twitter, advanced Twitter. So again, welcome to today's uh, webinar. Uh, I really am going to take us through the very basics of how, why you would be, why you would um, use Twitter, um, what is Twitter, why, why you would want to tweet or use Twitter, uh, the basic language of Twitter or the terms we use in Twitter, finding people to follow, um, sending and receiving tweets, and then a few helpful tools. Again, the advanced Twitter webinar will primarily be about these tools that can help Twitter be a little bit more useful than just the regular Twitter.com um, website. Um, so this is what Twitter looks like, just to, to start us off from that perspective. Um, this is my Twitter account. Uh, you can see on the right side here, this is what we call our feed. Uh, and this is where the latest tweets come in, so they're chronological. So as another tweet comes in, these will all move down. Um, and then on this side, we have the information about me, uh, how many tweets I've made, how many people I'm following, uh, how many followers I have. And I can learn more about these folks by clicking on these links. Um, anything that's read pretty much on Twitter is a link. <laughs> in, in my case, anyway, it's read. But um, anything that you see in a tweet like this, these are all clickable link that will lead you to more information. So these will lead you to lists of the actual people included in these lists. Um, up here you have some other places you can go inside of Twitter that will help you see who's mentioning you, who's retweeting you, um, suggestions Twitter has for people that you might want to follow. Just to see your own feed, you can go to the me section. Uh, you can search for people to follow or terms that you want to follow uh, or find out what's going on with them. And then you can always write a tweet by coming down here and writing it in here. Uh, and then there's always a list of um, people that Twitter's suggesting that you might want to follow. And then towards the bottom um, of, the, of the first screen that you get to before you scroll down, there's always trending topics. And a trending topic is a, is a topic that has become viral in Twitter. It's so popular that it's moving out across the Twitterverse, as they say. Um, and I generally ignore that. I don't find that many adult ed topics uh, end up in that category. But if you have a, you know, if there's a big um, event happening in the world, that would probably show up as a trending topic. So it might be something you would want to use as a teacher uh, with your students. But uh, for me as a professional, for my personal learning network, which is really how I use Twitter, um, I don't find that tends to be so useful for me. Um, so why do I tweet? And, and this is very much my reason for tweeting. Um, I did have a conversation with some colleagues about this because, again, I find uh, probably out of all the social media tools that I use and I'm familiar with, Twitter is the one that I really resonate with and that a majority of my friends and colleagues do not. So I understand that it's not a uh, – it doesn't – the use of it, I think, or the, the true function of it um, – in my perspective, or the, the, what I find to be the truth, uh, is is not something that's easily found for other people, or is not true for other people. But really, I look at Twitter for me um, about as, as a way to get information. And so, as I was talking to my colleagues, we were talking about how do you find information, or what is how do we interact with information? And there seemed to be two main ways that we were interacting with information. One was that we were going out searching for it when we needed it, and the other one was that we would we would sign up in advance for for in methods that would lead us to get information as it was made available. And so it might or might not connect with what we were particularly interested in at the moment. Um, so when we're searching for information, magazines and newspapers are still a very common way um, that we, we search for, for information. 
uh, books also. But Google has probably become the way that most of us start our process out. So, you know, you're looking for information about how to cook something or how to add a uh, document to another document without losing its formatting or something like that. Google might be a place that you would go to on the, on the internet. Um, what I found recently is that I tend to use Google Image a lot as well as a way as a search that I'm doing either because I want the actual image or because the image is a more exact search uh, term in a way than, than just a regular Google. Um, YouTube is also a common search. You might either put that into your search when you're searching in Google or Bing or whatever search engine you're using, or you might go to YouTube itself and look for a video on how to do something or on your favorite musician, their latest song or something like that. Um, and Wikipedia, obviously, when I Google, often Wikipedia is the first thing that comes up. So I could go to Wikipedia to start with. I, I actually don't do that, but it is an area that I, a, a place where I definitely know I can get information. And then Amazon and other online retailers are, is another place where I might go for information to know the price of something, to know if it's available, to know what the range of options are, whether I'm actually shopping or not. So that was kind of, I think, felt true for most of us, that that was how we search for information. Um, for information sent to us, again, magazines and newspapers and books um, are a way that we get information. Um, you know, you are a person who likes to knit. Uh, so you have a subscription to a knitting magazine with the belief that some of the content that will come to you from that magazine will be useful to you. But it, and it might be something you go back to to look at, but when it arrives, you're just going to, you know, kind of flip through it and find the articles that are useful for you. Um, email, I think, is the main way that I get information sent to me. Uh, and that's partially because in almost all these other um, places I, I get email, get information from come to me through email. Um, so email means, you know, in this case, it's that I've signed up on some mailing list or I bought something and now I get email sent to me and sometimes there's information that's useful. I sign up on mailing lists. Um, I, I sign up on organizations' websites and so then they send me their updates through email. Uh, Google Alerts is a, is a tool I've used where I go into Google and set up an alert and, and Google, when it searches the internet every day, uh, sends me an email to tell me that it's found content uh, that has to do with my search. So that but that comes in through my email. RSS feeds, similarly, I don't I don't use RSS feed very much, but this is a way to sign up to get uh, the anything that's updated on a blog that you might be following. Um, there are other other ways to use, use RSS feed. And for me, the few that I have do tend to come through my email. You you could have an RSS reader somewhere that you would go to and see what has come in, kind of like podcasts, you know, you go to the, go to have them automatically sent to you and, and sit and wait for you in iTunes or something like that, uh, or on your device. Um, saved searches, so I have a search on kayak.com, which is a place to find cheap tickets to fly uh, and other kinds of um, travel arrangements. And I have searches there for specific locations that I have relatives and that I might want to visit in and get emails every day to let me know what the price of those tickets are. Um, Facebook, I can go to Facebook certainly and find out what's going on in the world or the world of my friends, but I also get emails often that tell me that something has been added or people have responded to a conversation that I'm in. Uh, and then the links group, which we're going to talk about um, at the end a little bit about what links is, but links is an online um, learning, personal learning network or an online platform for you to meet with other people who have similar interests that you do within adult education. Uh, and that is another place where you could go daily and see what's going on as well as go when you need actual information. So it would actually fit in both of these categories. So if, if so looking at all of this, I still feel pretty happy about my um, tools for searching for information when I need it, but what I'm not, happy with is the amount of time and work that I have to do to move through all the content that's coming to me on a daily basis in my email. Uh, so if that's going to be the one way that I get information sent to me other than some things that are mailed to me physically, um, it's, a, it's a frustrating process and I, I feel like I do a lot more work to get a lot less information than I do with Twitter. So just to show you as an example, this is what my inbox looks like. Uh, and there's 308 emails in my inbox. This is sort of the beginning of a day. I don't remember last week sometime. 
Uh, and you can see this is a view on my laptop screen, so it's a little smaller than what I get on my big screen, but you can see that it's actually very hard to tell what exactly is going to be inside any of these emails. A lot of the emails are continuations of a conversation, um, so you can see that there's forwards and reads and all these things like that. Um, I can see who they came from, and so that could be a sign that it's important rather than if it was someone you know, I can tell who it's from, and that might help me know that it's going to be useful. Um, but I, you know, half of these emails could be people just thanking you know someone for the last email or saying yes or no or something like that. And so I have to kind of open up each email in order to know. There, there's a few. There's a few. I have to say my process in the morning is to come in, scroll through my inbox. Identify the ones that I can delete without even opening. So those are deleted. Then I have another section of folks when I when I stream through this um, that I know I'm going to have to respond to. And some of those I'll give a little red flag to, and some of those I will open up and respond to immediately because I can without getting any more information. And then there's a middle set which sort of sits in my inbox because I don't quite know what to do with it, uh, and and that feels bad. <laughs> it feels like I have, you know, sort of laundry that I haven't done. Um, and when I was talking to my colleagues about this, we all felt a little bit that this was a challenge in our own lives everywhere, that, you know, you have this sort of, you come in with your mail, uh, uh, and you have your junk mail that you can easily throw out um, or recycle, and then you have your mail that you have to deal with, bills and so forth, and you put them in a special place. But there's this other layer of mail that maybe you need to review, maybe you need to keep it, maybe you don't. And, and some of us have really great systems for dealing with it immediately, some of us don't, some of us break our system. Um, so this issue of trying to get rid of stuff is really a, a struggle. So that is something I, for me is particularly frustrating and feels bad. And so not only am I, is it taking me a long time to go through all this email, but I'm not handling it very well and I'm feeling bad about that. Whereas when I go to my Twitter account, which is what this on the right is again the, t the feed that I see, I have no responsibilities for deleting any of these tweets. These are all going to come in. If you are someone who finds it a little breathless that there's this constant feed and, and you know, I'm following about 700 people, so there's going to be constant updates coming through, um, that can feel a bit bad. And I think for me, I'm okay with that. But if that was something that was uncomfortable for you, you could just follow fewer people. Uh, but one of the things that you, I think, have to come to terms with with Twitter is that you you are only going to come to Twitter during certain moments, and that's when you gather some information, and then the rest of the time you're away. But then you have tools that help you search Twitter for when you want to go back and find content that, that you might have missed during the day when you weren't able to sit on Twitter. So I, there's ways to manage that a little bit, I think. Um, so what I like here is that the information is coming to me, and I've set that up by following people. So my work was really at the beginning of all this, or as I go on, to add people that I follow and to take and to unfollow people who are no longer useful for me or not not sending out tweets that are useful for me. Uh, and that's a very that's that's absolutely your responsibility. And there's no um, there's nothing personal about that, so feel very free to do that. There's nothing the other the other person doesn't know that you unfollowed them. Uh, you know, so it's a very it's, again, it's your responsibility to keep your feed useful to follow and unfollow as you need to. Um, it's a one-way street, unlike Facebook, where, you know, if I'm your friend, you're my friend. Um, in Twitter, there's absolutely no expectation that just because I follow you, you need to follow me. It really should be based on the fact that I'm putting out useful information for you, uh, and that's why you would follow me. Um, what I like is that it's there for me when I go. So I'm, I don't have time for three days to go to my Twitter account, but then I do have time on the fourth day, and I go, and there's some information for me, and I can quickly, I guess what I've really learned to do, what I've practiced uh, to do is this scanning, where I can kind of quickly scan down this list and identify and identify one tweet, perhaps, that I find interesting or useful right now, uh, we happen to be having a conversation at work about copyright, so this kind of immediately, this tweet down here immediately sort of catches my eye, and I might go ahead and click on that link and see what that article is. Um, interest in using copyrighted materials in your classroom. Um, and if it's useful, I might forward it as an email to people who only read email. I might retweet it. Um, I might save the link somewhere, uh, or I might ignore it and just keep going. And for me, I think if I learn five new things, I feel pretty good and I can stop. 
Uh, it might be less, it might be more, depending on the day, but that's all I'm looking for. So there's no idea that I'm going to go into every one of these tweets and click on everything. And I would liken that to a newspaper or magazine that you, you know, you get it, but you don't read, very rarely do we have the time or the, or the desire, really, to read every single article in a newspaper or a magazine. We go in, we look through, we find the section that we're particularly interested in, we look for the headlines and, and the pictures, and that helps us to determine which articles we might find most useful. Uh, we might scan a few and decide that they're useful or not, and we might share some of that with our colleagues and friends and family. Um, and that's really what Twitter's like. So it's a very, you know, there are days I have time to sit and read every single tweet, but that's not my usual technique. Um, and then within Twitter, there are these things called hashtags, um, and we can also use keyword searches and, and lists, which again we'll talk more about in the advanced Twitter, uh, which allow us to, when we're ready to look for information, to go and actually search through. And then I can also follow organizations I might be interested in who, you know, I want to keep updated on what they're doing, what, what courses they're offering, whatever. And instead of me having to remember to go to their website and check it out, here comes a tweet, I click on the link and it takes me out to a class that, that I might be interested in or a news item that I might be interested in. So one of the criticisms, so that's why I tweet, right, is to get information sent to me. I filtered it by deciding who I followed. And now I have the joy of going there when I want to and leaving when I, when I want to and not having any responsibility to put anything in folders or anything like that. Um, one of the other criticisms, so beyond the fact that it just doesn't make sense or why do I need another thing, another tool, uh, one of the other kind of comments people make often about Twitter is, you know, it's so short. How can it be a useful tool uh, for really sharing useful information? And it is 140 characters, which is really based on what the original text message size was. I think my text message now is up to 160 characters. But, uh, you know, text messages are short, and we still are able to send quite important information via text message. So that's already part of the argument to me, is that if you've ever texted people, you know that you can actually share quite important information via text. But I also want to show you an example with Maureen Evans here, who um, is a her project on Twitter is really to write full recipes in a single tweet. Um, so here's an example of one of her tweets. Um, rhubarb upside down, cupcakes, beat one half cup sugar and melted butter, two eggs, um, a cup of yogurt plus two cups of flour, two teaspoons of baking powder, a teaspoon of salt, butter, 12 cups, so that the butter the 12 cup holder thing, uh, a tablespoon of sugar, two tablespoons of rhubarb, batter in each, and then bake them 25 minutes at 350 degrees. So she did an amazing job of really getting a lot of information to you. Um, and that's without links or tweets, retweets or hashtags or anything like that. So she's just giving you pure content in her tweet. And that is one way that we do we use Twitter. I would say that's rare. I would say that the majority, especially the kinds of tweets I'm most likely to send myself and the ones I particularly enjoy receiving, um, tend to have links in them that take me out to broader content or, or an article that backs up the headline that came in the tweet. So the, the tweet itself really acts more like a headline with a link to actual content. So in this second example here, Deb Hargrove, who goes by, she's from Florida, so it's Florida Tech Girl. Um, she's retweeting somebody, and we'll talk about retweets in a minute, but she's retweeting Florida Literacy, and they said, this is the President's budget for adult education, and then there's some hashtags, and then this Owly link um, is a link, so um, it's, a, it's a shortened link, and we'll talk about that as well. Uh, and if I clicked on that, now I go out and actually see the President's budget uh, for adult education, and so that's really useful for me, and I could retweet this uh, because I think that's important information for adult education. So. That's really what I'm looking for in how I tweet and how the kinds of tweets I want to be able to read. So the basics of Twitter, retweeting, hashtags, and shortening links. Um, retweet is really just a way to take content that came to you through Twitter and send it back out to your followers because you only you received it because you followed someone and now you're taking that information and sending it out to your followers. And this is really how the trending topic thing happens where, you know, Justin Bieber sends out a tweet to his well, he probably is a trending topic no matter what he does. But um, if I send out a tweet to my 1,000 followers and half of them send that tweet out to their followers, eventually that tweet then is going to move out in a sort of exponential way. Um, but it also allows me to 
um, you will know that I've retweeted you, so it's sort of a compliment to you, and you might look at me and we'll see if we, you know, I might be someone you want to follow, we might have a connection there. Um, and I think it even adds a little bit of um, trust to the tweet, that it's not just me saying things, it's that I'm quoting someone else, and we actually give a lot of weight to that. So retweeting is actually a really common way um, of tweeting. And for many people who start out, it might be the first way that you send a tweet, is that you retweet something that, that someone you follow has said. So retweeting just looks like this, the RT. Um, so you add an RT for retweet, and then the person's Twitter name, or Twitter handle, as we call it, which is always an at symbol with their name. And their name will have no spaces in it, so that's their Twitter name. And in this case, you can see it's red, so if I was to click on that, for instance, I would go out and see that person's whole Twitter feed. Um, so again, anything that's red in this tweet is really a link that will send me out to other content. So in this case, the retweet would send me out to the person's Twitter um, account so I could see everything that they tweeted and decide if I liked them and wanted to follow them. The other big uh, thing in Twitter, and probably a term you've heard and scratched your head about, is hashtags. And hashtags have now spread into um, Facebook, and I know they're used in other social media tools. I've seen them on Pinterest. I've seen them in Tumblr. Uh, basically, it's a way of denoting a tag. So if you've used YouTube or any other social media tool, tagging is a very important thing we do. And normally, we delineate tags by having a word or a phrase and then a comma. Um, and that, in this case, the number symbol helps to, to, sh to kind of indicate that this is a tag. Um, and it does require that there's no spaces, again, inside the phrase if you're going to use more than one word. Uh, and you want it to be short, because this is Twitter, so everything needs to be short. So you're going to choose, you're probably going to shorten your term. So here we have adult ed, which is a very common um, hashtag for things that we're interested in. Uh, and you can see, instead of writing out adult education, we're going with short. And part of that's because if someone retweeted me, then, you know, we're, every time that happens, we're adding more content to our original tweet, and, and it gets longer and longer, and it'll get cut off if we don't stay within the 140 characters. One of the things to know about hashtags is that there is no single place where hashtags are deemed hashtags. They, they really come from the world. So you, as a person, can make anything into a hashtag by just putting the number symbol in front of it without any spaces. Um, people use hashtags as a humor device as well, or a humor device, where they would say, you know, the weather's beautiful, hashtag not, uh, to sort of show that they were joking and it really wasn't beautiful weather. Um, so it is used that way as well, or as a sort of sarcastic comment addi additional to your content of your tweet. But again, in a professional sense, I tend to, I don't do that very much, and mostly I'm going to be using it as a way to help other people find this tweet. So you can imagine if you were searching Twitter for adult education, you typed in the words adult and education, that the search return would be giant, would be huge, and would have a lot of tweets in it that would be about adults who like education take vacations in Germany. That doesn't give you any information that you really cared about. Um, you're looking for something that someone who's an adult ed or someone who cares about adult ed is going to be posting out that, you know, um, it, you know in this case, the, the president budget for adult education. That's important information for you. So by putting the, the hashtag there, the writer of the tweet, the author of the tweet, is now putting a signpost on this tweet to help you find it when you're looking for this content. So again, it, anyone can make up a hashtag, but hashtags are only really as useful as they are used. So if you want a hashtag to take to have real meaning, or if you want to connect yourself to a search term that people are likely to use, you want to use something that everyone else is using. So in this case, adult ed is a really common one for us. Um, ed tech would be another one. Then if there's a conference, you'll find that people at conferences will often have a hashtag. And, and actually, I would advise that if you have any kind of event that you come up with a hashtag, and that would be a specific term that would help people find the tweets that are related to that event. So COAB tends to have a hashtag, COAB plus the year. So COAB 14 will be this coming one. And it means that you who are not able to come to COAB could, could during COAB, search for that hashtag and find all the tweets from the people who are at, at COAB. And I know for myself that when I'm at COAB, I'm tweeting links to PowerPoints, links to statistics that are quoted in the keynote speech, whatever. So all that content would be something you could find if you were following me. But even if you aren't following me, or you're looking for people to follow, you could search for that hashtag, COAB 14 and then you would be able to see all that content every day as it came in. So um, that's the power of the hashtag. 
Uh, and in this case, we have two, adult ed and then career pathways. Um, so the third part, we're going to talk about shortening links. And here's an example of someone who tweeted uh, a link that, so the, the headline is preparing for an iPad implementation, and then bit.ly is their shortened link. And if you clicked on this bit.ly link, uh, the place you would land is this long URL, ipadeducators.ning.com, et cetera, et cetera, which is 73 characters long. So if my tweet is 140 characters and 73 of them is just to, to have this link, that would be very frustrating. It would take up a lot of space. You wouldn't have very much room to say what you needed to say. Uh, so what we recommend is that you, I like Bitly, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about Bitly in a minute, uh, but Bitly is one place you can shorten links. Google shortens links. Some other sites now shorten their own links. Uh, but that's only 13 characters, and so it will take you to the same place as this long one, but it will only take up 13 characters of your very precious uh, tweet space. So um, if we're going to talk about like the best kind of tweet you could write, uh, this is a great example because they've done some nice things. They put in the um, hashtag inside the content of the tweet. Uh, so there's two of them. So where do GOP presidential candidates stand on ed policy? Um, sorry. Um, and then we take a look. And so so those are in there, and that way they're not taking up space. So the hashtag could be part of your actual content. It doesn't have to be at the end or the beginning of the tweet. But it, it, often, if you can't fit it into the content, you would put it at the end. So we have a third example here with that politics at the end. Um, and then the shortened link. So those are very handy. So include the hashtag from the content of the tweet. Include shortened links for more information. Write a headline, leaving out unnecessary words, but try not to use text in shorthand. So while I will definitely take out articles and I'll take out uh, you know, some other words that we might use to in a, in a normal sentence, um, I don't use typical texting shortenings. Like I don't use, you know, GR, the number eight, uh, for great. Um, but I might end up taking out vowels. That has happened. So it might be GRT, exclamation point, and people kind of know that that's how we do shortening inside Twitter. Um, and then using common abbreviations, and I have a funny example where we were trying to do, we were sending at a conference, we were talking about advocacy, we were trying to send a tweet out which had a list of a whole bunch of states in it, which were really long, so we were trying to shorten the link, shorten the names of those states, um, and we were spelling Massachusetts by taking out all the vowels, and it was really crazy, and then, you know, it wasn't until later we were like, oh, M-A, you could have just said M-A, because M-A is a recognized abbreviation, so you want to sometimes take a step back and think about well, what you know, what is the what is an expected abbreviation, or what is something that we that we people might understand better than me trying to figure out some crazy way to shorten this word. So with Bitly, Bitly.com is a site where you can shorten links, and this is good for a number of things, not just Twitter. Um, so if you've ever had an email where the link broke, this is a place where you could come to have made your link short, uh, and that way it wouldn't have broken inside your email probably. Um, but very, very valuable for uh, Twitter. So you go to bit.ly.com. Again, um, you can just go there and, and shorten any link you want. Um, if you do create an account on there, you end up with a few extra abilities, and it's totally free, um, and it saves your – so if you have an account, it will save all your shortened links, which is kind of like a bookmarking holder then. Um, it will also let you customize. So if you have an account, you can customize your link, and if you've ever been in a situation where you had to tell someone a URL, or you're in front of a group of people who have to type in a URL uh, all at the same time. A shortened URL is helpful, but having it with words in it rather than numbers and letters is really valuable as well. Uh, Bitly is case sensitive, which is very important to remember. And that's probably how they make so many, they can make so many unique shortened URLs is, to, is by being case sensitive. Um, and then what's kind of an added bonus is that you can, it will track how many times your link gets clicked. So, uh, you know, you send out your tweet, no one retweets you, you have no idea if you really, if anyone cares. Maybe no one did, that's all fine. Uh, but maybe it got clicked 500 times, and Twitter won't tell you that, but Bitly would. Uh, or similarly, if you send out an email, or you put it on your website, or on the back of your brochure, people go to that website, you, this is a way that you can track how many times it gets um, clicked. So it can be valuable that way. Even as a teacher, if you have a homework assignment and you want, you know, Again, you won't know exactly who clicked and who didn't, but you'll know if it got clicked 50 times or one time, uh, and that can be a valuable tool. Um, so, so another thing, and this is sort of a, a little 
uh, ads for the next webinar, which is on QR codes. Um, Bitly also lets you make QR codes very easily, so you would take your short link and add .qr at the end, but we'll talk about that on the QR code uh, webinar next week. So finding people to follow on Twitter, um, you can search, even if you don't have a Twitter account, you can search on Twitter, so you would go to twitter.com and then slash search, um, dash home, uh, and you could, you know, look up people's names, you could look up a topic, a uh, word, and you'll find people who are tweeting about that, hashtag, obviously. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, once you have a Twitter account, you have the additional bonus of inside Twitter being able to search in that bar, which it's a, it's a pretty, it's kind of a dull instrument, I have to say, their search is not the best tool they have. Um, what I do more is search by hashtag. Uh, and I also look at people who I follow and see who they follow. Because if I'm following them, it's because they're experts. Who are they following? Some of those people might be people I would like to follow too. So um, it's important for you to think about this a little bit if you don't have an account or if you're starting up your account again, uh, because Twitter now kind of requires you when you start your account to identify five people you're going to follow right when you're setting up your account. And that can be a little overwhelming if you have no idea. They'll give you a list of people who, for me, had no resonance at all. Um, so we're going to give you a list here of some people that you might want to follow. I'm, I'm LACNYC Nell. I work at the Literacy Assistance Center, and my name is Nell, so that's where that comes from. Um, O10 is an amazing organization in California that does a lot of technical assistance work and, and instructional work around technology. Uh, Florida Tech Girl, we already mentioned. Edudemic puts out a lot of really interesting stuff uh, on the website. All of these folks are pretty amazing. They're all people I follow and really find myself generally retweeting often and, and uh, find them very, very valuable. Lynx has its own Twitter account, so um, we'll be tweeting out of that about these webinars. So these are, again, I'm going to send you, you'll have access to this PowerPoint on SlideShare. Um, and also, for those of you who registered for this, you'll also get this stuff sent to you uh, via email. So you can come up, you know, even if you picked one of these people right now and wrote down their name, when you go and search them, you'll find who they follow, and that will give you five people to follow immediately. Um, I would also recommend following one or two people just for fun. So, you know, I wouldn't say Justin Bieber for me, but maybe Joan Jett. Uh, or um, if you like knitting, you'll find someone who tweets about knitting. Uh, so that, you know, that way you can have a little bit of the fun of it, too. I, I find the professional tweets fun myself, but I think that it's fun to get a sense of the round, the sort of broad, broad spectrum uh, of Twitter. Um, there's very humorous tweets out there, too. You can follow funny, funny people on Twitter. Um, so sending and receiving tweets, once you do start your account, and again, to start your Twitter account, you go to twitter.com and start your account there. Um, and that's also where you would probably start off with your sending and receiving tweets. Uh, you can set up on Twitter.com to get certain tweets. You can identify who, who, which Twitter people tweet, tweet people you want to receive uh, text messages from. So even if you have a simple um, cell phone, as long as you have a texting plan, you could actually get tweets coming in that you would particularly want to get uh, in a timely manner on your phone. So um, for instance, we've been having a lot of weather issues in New York City, which has impacted our um, subway system, and so I've been getting tweets from the subway system to tell me when trains are not running. Uh, and they're actually, you know, that's a much easier way for me to get real-time information than any other method I have. Um, so they are allowed to come in as a text message on my phone. But I don't follow, you know, if I was following Justin Bieber, for instance, I would not have him coming through on my cell phone necessarily. Um, there are many applications and uh, various apps for your phone and your, and your tablets. Um, that can make Twitter more enjoyable or easier to organize. Um, Hootsuite is something we'll look at a little bit today. Um, and Hootsuite is, I'm coming to terms with it. I used to use TweetDeck, and TweetDeck is supposed to be going away. So I, I'm trying to get used to Hootsuite. I like TweetDeck better, but they're both similar in that they allow you to have multiple columns. So we saw earlier that that Twitter feed is a single long column. With Hootsuite and um, TweetDeck, you could set up several columns so you have here my home feed, which is the same feed I would see on Twitter.com, but then I can also, at the very same time, see who's tweeting about me or mentioning me. Uh, and then I can also have a, you know, a search for specific terms. So here I have adult ed, it could be COVID-14. So whatever tweets were coming in there um, would, would be something that I would be able to track very easily. 
So that's another whole tool, and it would be truthsuite.com, and you would go um, sign up on there. You could also manage Facebook through here, and if you're managing several Twitter accounts, you could have them all here so that you could send out messages on all of them at the same time, or specifically on two of them at a, you know. So if you're manage, if you are managing several accounts, Hootsuite can be a place where you can manage many of them in one place. Um, tweet chat is something I use a lot when I'm at conferences, and I do have to say that my love of Twitter came from being at a conference and, and being kind of anti-Twitter before I went to the conference, and then during the conference realizing the sort of magical back channel that occurs during conferences. So while we're all physically in the same space going to our, our different sessions, we might not have a lot of opportunity to talk to one another, especially during a session itself. Uh, and that Twitter can become this sort of back channel, not necessarily negative, it can be very positive, and it can be negative, uh, but a place where people can have conversations about what's going on by using the hashtag of that conference and then following that. So then you can have, you know, kind of almost live conversations happening or chat happening. Uh, so this is an example of tweet chat um, using COE 12 back in, when I went to COE 12. Uh, and What's interesting is that it also, if you have a Twitter account, you can use this without a Twitter account and just follow the feed. But if you have a Twitter account and you log into it, it allows you to actually send your tweets from here uh, in this space up here. Uh, and it will include your hashtag. So that's something that's very easy to forget when you're using it. Pretty, you know, you need to use it every time. It's easy to forget it. And in this case, it will already be put in for you. Um, and then one of the other tools I really, really love is Paperly. And Paperly is something that we will talk more about in the um, advanced Twitter. But this is really a, an online magazine layout that allows you to, um, it can be used for other purposes, not just Twitter, but I use it with Twitter. You set it up, you give it a name, you go in, you tell Paperly that you want it to pull content that either has a hashtag adult ed or someone's Twitter name. And it will, every day, it will pull that content into this magazine layout if the tweet has a link in it. And what it does is it basically takes that link and makes a tiny little story using that link. So the picture from the article might show up there or the, you know, the website or whatever. So for those of you who are not very, uh, don't like that feed, <clears throat> or that you're trying to communicate with other people who might not use Twitter, Paperly could be something you could develop and then have other people go to Paperly and read it as a daily magazine or as a weekly magazine. One of the other really lovely things about Paperly is that it does archive automatically so that, um, we haven't said this, but Twitter is actually very ephemeral. It is a constantly churning machine, but it means that tweets I sent maybe more than six months ago, or depending how, how much you tweet, um, even a month ago, could disappear so that when you search, you, they won't show up. Uh, and that's just because it doesn't, there's no, you don't put it in folders. It doesn't, it doesn't have a, it's not a very easy, it doesn't have a system for really being put away uh, and easy to come back to. So the, that's a downside and an upside. I mean, I think that goes back to that issue I had earlier of not having responsibility for me to go in and manage it too much. But if I set up a paperly, then automatically the content I have told paperly to gather for me will be archived and I can go back. And so when I do COID 12, for instance, this year with COE 14, if I was to go in today and look for COE 13 hashtag, probably no tweets would show up. But if I go back to those, the dates of COE 13 in my paperly, I will find all the content that had links in it from that period of time there available to me and to other people. Um, students could make their own paperly. Again, it doesn't even have to do with Twitter, but it could be to do with Twitter on their favorite topic. It could be a great way for them to practice reading, but on content that they're particularly interested in. There is spam on Twitter, uh, and the spam that I've heard of, I'm, I'm, I knock on wood, I'm very lucky and have not had a direct experience, but what I have heard of is that people, you know, you'll get a tweet that is a direct tweet from your best friend saying, oh my God, did you see this picture of you? And then there's a link. <clears throat> and if you pick, if you click on that link, it will take you out to something that might look like Twitter and you log into it and basically you're giving access to your Twitter account to the spammer and then they will spam using your account saying the same thing oh my gosh, have you seen this picture of you to all of your followers? Uh, so if you experience this or you're seeing it, it's good to remember that you can report it. Probably the person who's doing it, I mean, the person whose Twitter account has been taken over will know that it's happening, but some of them won't because they're not tweeting very much themselves. And I've had several people who I get these direct tweets from who, if it's a, a little word and, you know, something that doesn't, 
very few, very few of us at this point would be getting tweets from our best friends telling us to look at the picture on Twitter. I think we're much more likely to get an email um, or Facebook or something else. So Twitter, if it's a suspicious situation, I would say you can you can double check with them before you click on that link or before you log into anything after you click on the link. So what to do right now? So before you create your Twitter account on Twitter.com, think of a good Twitter name. Short is good. Uh, that's all, really the only rule I can tell you, that short is good. We've definitely wrestled with having a name that, you know, represented our organization. Um, I, I took LAC NYC now because I thought we would have a lot of people from my organization tweeting and they might all be LAC NYC and then have their name at the end. And that's not been true at all. No one else has done this at all. So if I was doing it again, I might just be now essentially. Uh, and there's certain cachet to having your name be your actual Twitter name. But even that might be long, right? So Eckersley's long. I might not want that. I might just want to be now. And right now there's probably 50 more out there. Um, so, you know, for yourself, I, what I would say is while it's important, it's not that important. In the end of, at the end of the day, I'm going to follow you not because of your Twitter name, but because of what you're actually tweeting. So don't be too worried about it. But the, like I said, the key at the end of the day is really that it's just short. So that if anyone wants to retweet you, using your Twitter name doesn't make the tweet completely useless. Um, you also, before you start your Twitter account, will want to think about the five people you're going to want to follow. And you can have more than five, but it's going to ask you for a minimum of five. And it's good to have that list right beside you. Uh, certainly, the list here gave you many options. But you should go and check it out yourself. And as I mentioned earlier, too, you know, follow people that are interested in maybe hobbies that you have or neighborhoods you live in, newspapers you read, TV channels you watch, all of those folks and organizations have their own Twitter accounts and they're definitely worth following. You can always unfollow them. Um, all right. So then what to do in the next few days or a few weeks? Um, so once you've created your Twitter account, log into it every day to practice that because it's very easy for that to be the part that stops you from ever doing it again. Uh, you forget your password or whatever. Uh, retweet one tweet a day just to do it, just to get it out there. Um, I mean, pick something that you really want to get out there, but but do it as an action. Uh, and create your own tweets. You know, it's not it's not a sin to tweet something like, wow, my first tweet, or, you know, um, hey, world, I'm checking out Twitter. What do you think? You know, it's not that's not a bad way to start. I would not be offended if I got that as a tweet. I'd be happy for you, and I'd probably actually interact with you. I'd probably send you a direct tweet. Uh, I might even follow you. So, um, that's not a bad way to start. Uh, and then find a way that Twitter can fit into your life. So I take 15 minutes usually in the morning right after I've gone through all my email and I'll retweet the things I find most important. Um, I know other people who tweet at night when they're in front of the TV and they're kind of, you know, have a computer in their hands as well and they're, they send it out. But again, it, it's just 15 minutes. Uh, but find, find that time and try to make it into a routine for yourself and find a device that feels best. Um, I find computers are still the easiest way to tweet from, but I tweet from my cell phone all the time. Uh, and then try out Hootsuite or one of the other tools we talked about today and we will be talking about more at the event So uh, consider consider starting it up and trying it out and giving it a week or two so that it begins to feel comfortable. Certainly trying it out at a conference I think is highly, highly um, rewarding. So my name, my Twitter name is at LACNYC Nell for Literacy Assistance Center, New York City Nell. Uh, and that's my email address. So you can contact me there too. Uh, I have created a Scoop It, which is a place online that kind of grabs content uh, on Twitter and adult education. I haven't updated it for a long time, but I think it updates itself a little bit. Uh, but you can check that out if you want to. I did want to talk a little bit about literacy information and communication system, which is links. Um, Links provides you, well, I'll let you read this yourself, but it's worth checking out. It is a free, uh, it's free, uh, has three main components to it. So there's a professional development piece to it. It's all professional development, but there's actual instructional pieces to it. There's a collection, a resource collection piece to it, and there's an online community piece to it. Uh, and I would definitely recommend checking out all three of those components. Uh, I work most closely with the um, online community piece, and there is an online community group specifically on technology and learning. So consider checking that out. Um, yeah, so here it tells you a little bit more about that. 
Um, there are regional professional development centers who um, are your resource in your region, uh, and they will help to forward out face-to-face -face trainings and things like that. They also have a, a mailing list. Um, usually their, their main relationship is with your state education resource center or whoever is helping the PD from a state level. Um, and there is an Integrating Technology and Adult Education Classroom online course that we've developed. Um, I helped to develop it with other folks from um, Lynx. Uh, it is a four-hour online course, asynchronous, um, on using Moodle. Uh, and it will give you the basics for how to integrate technology into the adult education classroom. Uh, and part of it is to connect with the online community so that you can meet with other people and have conversations in real time, even though you can take the course in your own time. Um, and these are the steps on how to get there. Uh, so that's it for today. This has gone a little long, but um, we covered a lot of information. Uh, and uh, do think about following links also on Twitter at link underscore ed, um, also on LinkedIn and on YouTube. And I look forward to seeing you on Twitter. All right, thank you very much.